Okay, hello and welcome back to Grocket OG TV. This is the GMAT edition here. We're doing the 12th edition of the guide, the official guide to the test. We're going question by question, cover to cover. Last time uh, we left off with um, question 117. So our next question is uh, question number 118 in the problem solving section on page 168. Uh, this is me up here in the corner, Jim Jacobson. And uh, without further ado, we should get started. So that was page 168, question number 118. And we have some answer choices here. 7, 11, 13, 16, and 26. So the ratio of the length, length to the width of a rectangular advertising display is approximately 3.3 to 2. If the width of the display is 8 meters, what is the approximate length of the display in meters? It is always good to double check the units. I guess they could have switched from meters to centimeters or something, although judging by the answers, uh, they're all in the same ballpark. So um, we can set this up as a simple equation. The ratio of the 1, or the ratio of the length to the width, is 3.3 to 2. And we know that that is then, that corresponds, and this is uh, length to the width. So length over width. Um, and we know that it's actually 8 meters wide. And then, so we're trying to get the length, which we can just call x. So we could cross multiply 2x equals 3.3 times 8. Uh, the shortcut here is to recognize that there's a pretty easy way to convert halves, you know, things with two in the denominator, to eighths, things with eight in the denominator. And so that is to multiply by four over four. So 3.3 over two times four over four, which is the same thing as multiplying by one, but it changes the way the numbers look. 3.3 um, times four ends up being 13.2, and we multiply across the denominators and we get eighths. And so this is a question that asked for the approximate length of the display. 13.2 is approximately the same as 13, and certainly no closer to any of the other answer choices. So the correct answer is choice C, um, 13. All right, we've moved on to the next page, page 169, number 119. We have some various expressions here, and I want to make sure I get these in correctly. We have 2 less than or equal to x less than 16. Less than or equal to. That is less than or equal to. Uh, okay, so those are our answer choices. So which of the following is equivalent to the pair of inequalities x plus 6 is greater than 10 and x minus 3 is less than or equal to 5? So uh, we can write these down separately. We have x plus 6 is greater than 10. And we also have x minus 3 is less than or equal to 5. And we can just remember you can treat inequalities like equations. Um, <clears throat> you know, you can add and subtract, multiply and divide both sides by the same thing. The only thing you have to be careful of is when you multiply or divide by a negative number, you have to switch the direction of the sign. It doesn't look like you're going to have to do any of that. So on the one on the left here, we just subtract 6 from both sides. So that gives us x is greater than 4, which actually on its own <laughs> gets us to the right answer. There is only one answer where x is greater than 4. That's answer choice D. Note this part here. So if we were in a hurry, we could do that, but let's just be sure. Um, the one on the right, x minus 3 is less than or equal to 5. We can add uh, 3 to both sides. We get x is less than or equal to 8, which does correspond to the other portion of answer choice D. Writing them down in one 
long expression, we need to have x less than 8 but more than 4. So we would just do exactly what's in answer choice D. x is greater than 4 and less than or equal to 8, answer choice D. Number 120 on page 169. So we have 5, 6, D, 7, thirds, D, 10, thirds, D, 7, halves, D, and then 9, halves, D. Okay, so David has D books, appropriately, which is three times as many as Jeff, and one half as many as Paula. How many books do the three of them have all together in terms of D? So we know that David equals D. We know that Jeff, we have Jeff and then we have Paula. Jeff in terms of D, so David has three times as many as Jeff. So Jeff has one third as many as um, David. So, um, you know, the original thing said, um, you know, D equals three times what Jeff has. So if we're solving for what Jeff has, we divide both sides by three, we get J equals one third D. I just figured I'd write that math out in case you didn't follow it when I said it. Um, and we also find out then Paula, David has half as many as Paula. So using the same kind of um, David equals one half what Paula has, but we're trying to solve for what P equals in terms of D, so we multiply both sides by two. That gives us P equals two D. If he has half as many as she does, she has twice as many as he does. So Paula equals two D. And how many books do the three of them have together in terms of D? So now we've arranged all three here in terms of D, and we just have to add them together. So it's David's books, plus Jeff's books, plus Paula's books. Now it's pretty clear that we don't have a common denominator here, um, and it looks like thirds, because of Jeff's books here, um, thirds are going to be the common denominator. So um, <clears throat> D in thirds is the same as three-thirds D. Jeff's are gonna stay the same. And uh, two expressed as thirds is the same thing as six thirds D. So three thirds plus one third plus six thirds, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, equals ten thirds D. The answer choices require no further simplification or modification, so that gets us to answer choice C as the correct answer. All right, number 121, still page 169. We have 15, 16, 28, 56, and 64. There are eight teams in a certain league, and each team plays each of the other teams exactly once. If each game is played by two teams, what is the total number of games played? Okay, so we have eight eight teams total. Um, each game is played by two teams, uh, so that you know it's one team versus the other one. Just to be clear, what they mean about that. Um, so, because each team needs another team to play a game, they're never actually going to play themselves. You know, it's never a one-team game. So each of the each team in this league plays seven games because they play each of the other seven teams. So each team plays seven games. So imagine, you know, imagine this is, you know, A, B, C, D, E, what the hell is that? One, two, three, four, five, F, G. Um, so team A plays B, C, D, E, F, G. They play each of the other seven teams once. So each team plays seven games. There are eight teams. So 
that um, eight teams times seven games apiece. That gives us 56 games. But, so this is, that's one of the answer choices. So obviously, uh, answer choice E is just eight teams. Um, forgetting that a team that isn't going to play itself, this is just eight times eight, which is a trap answer. And it turns out that 56, eight times seven, is also a trap answer. Um, because uh, this, does, this does not take into account the fact that when A plays B in our first counting of the seven games that, that they play, um, it, it doesn't keep into account that um, when we went to B, we would separately count B times A, and, or B playing A. And remember that the original question says each team plays the other teams exactly once. So, you know, A versus B is the same thing as B versus A. It's the same game. So we only need to count it once. So this 56 games that we got to, we need to divide by two to get rid of all those double counting things. So 56 divided by two equals 28 games. Answer choice C. Okay, moving on. Uh, 169, number 122. So we have the opposite of a, the opposite of 1 over a, 0, 1 over a, and a. So an operation that looks like the Greek letter theta is defined by the equation a theta b equals a minus b over a plus b for all numbers a and b such that a does not equal the opposite of b. So um, a theta b equals um, a minus b over a plus b, where um, a does not equal the opposite of b. And you'll note that this thing here, the a does not equal the opposite of b, is not really a valuable clue. All that's doing is protecting them from creating a situation where they're dividing by zero, which is naughty. So um, that just eliminates one, one particular value for the solution, but that's okay. Everything else is fine. So then we need to figure out that, so if a does not equal the opposite of c, we're doing a theta c. I'm calling it theta, but it could just be just as easily be a smiley face or a star or a little leprechaun or something like that. Um, so it probably wouldn't give you a leprechaun, but um, it's gonna be just some symbol and what the symbol looks like doesn't actually matter. So what this equals then is a minus c over a plus C, and we know that that also equals zero, and A does not equal the opposite of C. Um, so we can eliminate the denominator as being zero, but this whole thing still equals zero. Uh, keep in mind that with any fraction, you know, sixths or thirty-sevenths or uh, halves or fifths. If you have zero in the numerator, that these all equal each other, and these all equal zero. So basically what that means is, regardless of what's in the denominator in this question, it's the numerator here that actually equals zero, um, because this whole expression equals zero. Zero with anything in the denominator, other than zero itself, um, is going to equal zero. So really this is just saying a minus c equals zero. And the question is, what does c equal? Well, we add c to both sides, we get a equals c, or you know, reverse it, c equals a, which is answer choice e. The two are equal. This is the, the only way that these two, that this expression here, the only way that expression can equal zero is if c and a are equal, because then the numerator cancels, they cancel each other out. Okay, on to this second column on page 169. Question number 123, we have 1173, we have 
twelve dollars even. We have fourteen dollars and eighty cents. We have fourteen dollars even, and we have fifteen dollars and eighty seven cents. So the price of lunch for 15 people was $207, including a 15% gratuity for service. What was the average price per person excluding the gratuity? Gratuity is just another word for tip. For those of you who live in countries where tipping is part of the restaurant experience. So um, we can just say that X equals the average price per meal. So 15 times x with a 15% addition, 1.15 times that. So this is this is the total. This is the total meal price without the tip. This this guy here. Adds in the gratuity. That's an A. Um, that whole thing equals. Two hundred seven dollars. So we can just uh, divide both sides by one point one five. Do that over here. Two hundred seven and uh, one point one five. Add a couple zeros in here. So we have one one fifteen. Uh, this ends up being. Take that down and mix, mix it even. So the original uh, value was one hundred eighty dollars, um, and so, but of course, that's not what the question is actually asking. So the um, full meal without the tip equaled $180. Let's add the dollar signs in there to keep uh, things straight here. We need to figure out what the average price per person was. So now we have to divide 180 by the 15 people. So $12. So $12 even was the price before the tip the average price per person before the tip. Answer choice B. All right, 169, number 124. So we have 16%, 25%, 32 percent, 40 percent, and 52 percent. So in town X, 64 percent of the population are employed, and 48 percent of the population are employed males. What percent of the employed people in town X are females? So we set this up as a grid, basically. We have people who are employed, who are unemployed. And then we have people who are male and people who are female. Just like real life. This grid will have to do even though it's not the prettiest one ever. Okay, so we are given some of this information um, in the course of the uh, question. So we know that 64% of the population are employed. So males plus females, and let's just assume there's 100 people. Um, I mean, you know, we can just use this as percents too, but we know that this is 64 here. And we also know that 48% of the population are employed males. So 48% of the population are employed males. So um, these two numbers, the employed males plus the employed females, should equal 64% of the population. 
which means that the female, the employed female population is 64 minus 48 equals 16. And the question was, um, we're trying to get the ratio of employed females to the total employed population. So that equals 16 over 64, 16 for the females, uh, 64 for the total population percentage. 16 out of 64 is the same thing as 1 fourth, and that expressed as a percent is 25%. Answer choice B. Okay, last one on page 169. Number 125. So we have square root of p over q, p over q is q squared, p over 2q, q over p squared, and then q over p. So if p over q is less than 1, and p and q are positive integers, which of the following must be greater than 1? So we have p divided by q is less than 1. Um, and you can see then if we, um, either by reasoning or by algebra, we can determine that uh, p itself is less than q. And that's true of any fraction. Any fraction where the numerator is smaller than the, than the denominator, it's going to be less than 1, something like, you know, 3 fourths or 101, uh, 340 thirds. Um, all examples of p being less than q and the whole fraction being less than 1. So we need to know which one of these, which one of these answer choices must be greater than 1. So answer choice A, remember that um, here, the square root of 1 equals 1. So the square root of anything less than 1 is never actually going to equal 1, let alone be greater than it. Um, the only way you can get the square root of something and have that be greater than 1, because remember we're trying to get something that is greater than 1 total, that's what we're after. Question mark. So we're after this guy here. The square root of p over q, while it will be larger than p over q, um, because remember, as you square fractions, they get smaller, closer to 0. And as you take the square roots of them, they become larger, closer to 1. But they never actually reach 1, because it's only when the, fraction, when the number itself equals 1 that its square root would equal 1. So this guy is always going to be um, less than 1 which is not what we're after. It's not a. p over q squared. So we know that um, q is bigger than p. p is less than q. When you make the denominator of a fraction larger, the number itself becomes smaller. It doesn't make it a bigger number. So um, this gives us a larger denominator, which is a smaller number. And we need the whole thing to be greater than 1. So that does not help us at all. It's not answer choice B. Um, choice C, P over 2Q, again, doubling that um, denominator makes it larger, which makes it a smaller number. Q over P squared is an interesting case. So um, if we have, uh, for example, um, if we have P equals, let's say, 2, and q equals uh, 5, let's say. Um, the original fraction would have been 2 fifths, and uh, q over p squared would be 5 over 4, because we squared p. This is uh, q over p squared, and this is uh, p over q. So in this case, it actually does result in a fraction greater than 1. The numerator is larger than, than the denominator. However, if we pick p equals 
um, 2 and q equals 3, the original fraction is 2 thirds, and the new fraction q over p squared gives us 3 fourths. And in both cases, it's still less than 1. So because choice D does not always give us an answer greater than 1, it does say that it must be greater than 1, that's not it either. Now, of course, process of elimination has brought us to choice E, but realistically, we, if we had just looked at this one first, it would have been obvious. If P over Q is a smaller number over a larger number, making it less than 1, the inverse of that, Q over P, would put the larger number over the smaller number, which by definition is greater than 1. So choice E is our correct answer. And we feel a sense of satisfaction ha at having completed page 169. On to the next one. Okay, so 170, number 126. We have Seven, uh oh, seven twelfths. We have one and one half. We have one and five sevenths. Three and one half. And then the very old seven. So it would take one machine four hours to complete a large production order, and another machine three hours to complete the same order. How many hours would it take both machines working simultaneously at their respective constant rates to complete the order? So the answer in the official guide gives you the basically the way of deriving the work formula where you uh -oh. hmm. There we go. My tablet stopped working there for a minute. Oh, and I just deleted these. Okay, sorry, starting over. Um, there we go. All right, sorry about that. So this is page 170. I won't read it again, but I would have to print the answers in. 126, so 7 twelfths, 1 and 1 half, 1 and 5 sevenths, three and a half and seven. Where were we? I was talking about the work formula. So, um, you know, they have you doing this thing where the, uh, the, the explanation, and this is a way that you can always derive uh, these work formula type questions where if the one can do it in two, um, then it does, um, if it takes four hours, then it does one fourth of the thing, and then the other one does one third of the thing, and that equals one whatever of the total time, and then you get a common denominator, blah, blah, blah. The shortcut is there's actually a formula for this. When you have two items, two machines uh, doing the same job at different rates, um, you just make sure their rates are in a constant um, unit, and uh, the time it'll take is um, the rate that A does it times the rate that B does it over A plus B. And really what this is, is basically just going from this to this and, and making it into a formula. Um, I think it makes life easier. These questions are not so common on the GMAT that you absolutely have to memorize this formula. You could just as easily memorize the method for how to do it. But the shortcut, if you like shortcuts, is to just know this formula. This will work for any two machines. So um, A times B, so one's a four, so it's four times three over Four plus three, that equals 12 over seven, which is the same thing as one and five sevenths. That's your choice C. So the work formula is faster and is your buddy if you have spare brain space. So 170, number 127. Okay, so all of these involve savings, so we have combined with x minus y. And then we have, I'm not going to write out the whole answer because I guess I'm lazy. Um, combined with y minus x. Combined 
x. Separate with x minus y and separate with just y. And all of these are sense, but that'll become clearer when I read the question. So to mail a package, the rate is x cents for the first pound and y cents for each additional pound, where x is greater than y. Two packages weighing three pounds and five pounds respectively can be mailed separately or combined as one package. Which method is cheaper and how much money is saved? So we have a three pound package and a five pound package. And we need to figure out which is cheaper. Um, so for the first pound, it's x. Um, for each additional pound, it's y. And we know that x is greater than y. So it should be pretty clear immediately that because x is greater than y, that that first pound of each of every package you send is the is the most expensive. We want this, and we want to send the, both packages as a single unit. If we send it um, as two separate ones, we pay this x rate twice, which is the more expensive rate. X is greater than y. So clearly, any choices that have the, the two of them going separately cannot be right. That's not good. Um, so then the question is, how much money do we actually save? Um, and really, since there are only two packages, instead of paying x on the first pound of the second package, we're paying y. So, you know, the three pounds of this, this guy are x, y, y. And then this guy, if we pay, you know, if we do it all as one package, it's five y's. If we had mailed them separately, this would have been x, y, y, and this would have been x, y, 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 y. Um, so really, the difference between these two is just this part right here. Um, this is the expensive version, and this is the cheap version. So um, the difference, the amount of money we saved, is just this amount right here, x minus y, which is answer choice A. We can also do it algebraically. Um, basically what I, what I was doing up here, that the, um, the expensive way would have been um, 2x plus 6y. The cheap way, where we mail it as one package um, in a combined package, is just 1x plus, um, sorry, up here, uh, 7y. And so we can simply subtract these two equations from each other. So minus this whole quantity means 2x minus x. We get x. 6y minus 7y is just minus 1y. And that gives us that same answer of the difference of between the two being x minus y. So answer choice A is the correct one, no matter how you figure it out. One seventy, number one twenty-eight. So we have twenty thousand dollars, fifteen thousand dollars, twelve thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, and nine thousand dollars. So if money is invested at R percent interest, compounded annually, the amount of the investment will double in approximately 70 divided by R years. If Pat's parents invested $5,000 in a long-term bond that pays 8% interest, compounded annually, what will be the approximate total amount of the investment 18 years later when Pat is ready for college? So we find out that um, it doubles every 70 over R years. And we start off with $5,000. And we know that it's 8%, so 70 over 8 is when it doubles. 
and 70 over 8, you know, if this were 72 over 8, it would just be 9 to 1. So it's a little bit less. Um, uh, so it's actually, um, you know, 70 divided by 8 equals um, 8.75. So every 8.75 years, it doubles. So this is almost the same as 9 years. So 8.75 is approximately equal to 9. And we want to know what this does in 18 years. So after the first 8.75 years, or 9, if we want to count it that way, uh, this will be around 10,000 because it doubles. And then in another 8.75 years, or 9, if we want to think about it that way, it doubles again to 20,000. So, you know, in uh, whatever, 17.5 years or 18 years, um, it will have doubled to approximately $20,000. Uh, no other answer is close. We don't, we don't have to get the exact number. Choice A is the correct one. We just had to know basically that it was going to double twice in the time frame that it that the uh, question accounted for. So that is that. On to the next column. Still page 170. Okay. So on a recent trip, oh, I should put the answers in first, sorry. I guess I didn't have to, but I think it makes life easier. We can just kind of move through the problem interrupted, uninterrupted. 290 over 12.5 and 290 over 11.5, 295 over 12. Sorry, this one takes a little while to get all the answer choices in. Sometimes that happens. I suppose you could fast forward, but you wouldn't know. I guess you would see when I was done writing them. 285 over 12.5. Unless you're listening to this live, in which case, you know, you just have to wait and watch my exciting penmanship in action. 295 over 11.5. And... 295 over 12.5 over 285 and 11.5. So a lot of similar looking numbers on this one suggest that there's some conceptual differences here rather than mathematical differences. And we just have to be careful. Okay, so as I was saying, on a recent trip, Cindy drove her car 290 miles, rounded to the nearest 10 miles, and used 12 gallons of gasoline, rounded to the nearest gallon. The actual number of miles per gallon that Cindy's car got on this trip must have been between. So this is, uh, I find this question a little bit tricky, mainly because of this question of uh, rounding. Uh, you may have learned that when you're rounding, um, anything, you know, 0.5 and up goes up to the next thing and anything um, 0.4 and lower, or anything less than 0.5, goes the other way. Uh, this question treats 0.5 as the middle point where it could go either way, um, whereas the last point where it doesn't definitely go in the other direction. So um, really what this means then is that Cindy's mileage must be between, um, let's put Cindy here, hi Cindy. Cindy is between the best miles per gallon and the worst miles per gallon. And the worst miles per gallon would be the uh, smallest miles over the most gallons. So 
SMD is still in the middle here. And the best miles per gallon would be the most miles in the fewest gallons. So we just need to figure out what these four things are, what the smallest miles she could have gone are, what the most gallons, what the most miles, and what the fewest gallons. Okay, so we know that she drove her car 290 miles rounded to the nearest 10, which means that basically um, she drove between, so uh, this is miles here, 290 is what it was rounded to, which means it could have been as high as 295 or as low as 285. Remember, we're treating um, 5 as the last, the last point where it could still go either way. So, um, so 295 is the, the, the furthest she could have gone. Once it went to 296, it would have needed to have been rounded up to uh, 300. If we went down to 284, we would have had to have been rounded down to 280. But five is considered the midpoint for this question, which makes this one trickier, because you'll see none of these answer choices have a four in them. Uh, they all end in 290, 295, 285. Okay, so 285 is the smallest miles. Uh, 295 is the most miles. Um, her gallons of gas, um, she w we rounded 12. So the largest, the most amount of gas she could have used was 12 and a half. Using that same logic of 12.6, we would have had to round up to uh, 13. And the smallest it could have gone is 11.5. If it had been down to 11.4, we would have had to round down to 11. So these are the two numbers that could have been rounded to 12. So using this thing up here, we just have to fill in the, the actual numbers. The smallest miles was 285. The most gallons of gas is 12.5. The most miles over here, let's put Cindy in the middle again. Uh, most miles was 295. And the fewest gallons was 11.5. And this looks to me like answer choice D. I kind of had to scan them for a second because there's so many numbers. I was um, I kind of lost uh, the correct answer for a moment. Anyway, so this one's a little bit tricky in terms of the rounding. Um, our our tip off that it wouldn't have been, um, for example, you know, eleven point five to twelve point four. There. Um, is that there is no 12.4, uh, so that's how we knew that we had to use 5 as the middle point rather than four, 5 as the automatically go up to the next digit. All right, um, number 130. So absolute value of x is there 3. So which of the following inequalities is an algebraic expression for the shaded part of the number line above? I think I should probably draw the number line. So my apologies. Okay, so line is that probably should have been another color but okay I'll worry about artistic perfection on on my own time okay 
So, um, you know, absolute value is, um, in, the, in a strict sense, it's the distance of a number from zero on the number line. And so um, a number's absolute value, or the absolute value of a number is always expressed as a positive number, but in reality that number could have been on either side of zero. Now in this case, it's not an even split. We have three on the one side of zero and negative five on the other. Um, so we, and so this algebraic expression, if we were to write it expressed as it is, it would be um, x is less than or equal to three, because the dot is colored in, it includes three, and it's greater than or equal to negative five. We could even then, uh, because with inequalities, you can um, treat them like equations, you know, we can add and subtract easily, it's the multiplication and division that's tricky. So um, we could, for example, add plus one to the whole thing, because remember, absolute value really to be, to make any sense, um, it needs to always, uh, an inequality like this, we would need to have the same number here and its opposite over here on the inequality to make it into an absolute value expression. If we add one to it, if we add one here, we get negative four. And if we add one here, we get x plus one. If we add one to the next part, we get four. So x plus one is less than or equal to four and greater than or equal to negative four. In a, in a sense, it shifts this uh, line of eight, distance eight, three before zero, five after, evenly um, to both sides of zero. So, um, and here, x plus one, if x plus one is really greater than or equal to four and less than or equal to uh, sorry, greater than or equal to negative four, less than or equal to four, that's the same thing as saying the absolute value of x plus one is less than or equal to four. This was a four, by the way, and uh, that's the correct answer. So there we have it. One more question on this page. One seventy number one thirty one three ten twenty five thirty thirty five. A factory has five hundred workers, fifteen percent of whom are women. If fifty additional workers are to be hired, and all of the present workers remain, how many of the additional workers must be women in order to raise the percent of women employees to 20%? Okay, so let's just get our facts straight first. We have 500 workers. 15% are women. So if 15% um, are women, 15% of 500 is 75. So we actually have 75 women right now. In this imaginary scenario where we have 50 new workers and all the old workers are kept, we have 550 workers. And we're trying to get to 20% um, women. So we need to figure out what 20% of 550 would be. 10% um, would be 55, so 20% would be 110. So that would be 110 women if we had 20% of the 550 being women. So then we just need to figure out, well, what's the difference between this hypothetical situation of 110 women and this real situation of 75? Um, the answer is, of course, 35. 110 minus 75 equals 35, and so 35 of the new 50 workers need to be women to raise the percentage to 20%. And that actually could be another GMAT question. They could have said, um, you know, something like, uh, what, uh, what, for what percent of the new 50 workers need to be women in order to uh, raise it to 20%? And so then we would have to figure out 35 out of 50, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, that's not what the question was asking. 35 is the actual number of women that would need to be added for that to work out. Okay, let's move on to page 171. We definitely have time for this one. For 
20, 440, 450, 460, 480. So in a small snack shop, the average uh, revenue was $400 per day over a 10-day period. During this period, if the average daily revenue was $360 for the first six days, what was the average daily revenue for the last four days? So they, over 10 days, they made 400 per day. And on the first six days, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Over the first six days, they made um, 360 per day. So let's do this. And if the average is 400 each day, they were down $40 from their average. In order for the average to actually still be 400, they need to make up for this amount of money in these remaining four days. So if they were down $40 per day times six days, they need to get an additional $240 plus $240 over a four-day period, days 7, 8, 9, and 10. So it's $240 over four days or an extra $60 every day. So we have to add the... 60 to the average. So this was um, this was the average minus what they were short. If the average is if the average is 400, we need to add 60 to every one of these. And so each day was 460. Answer choice D. Hmm. Okay, I think I think we have time for for one more for sure. So we'll move on and do number one thirty three on page one seventy one. So we have five hundred dollars, one thousand dollars, two thousand dollars, three thousand dollars. So a certain country had a total annual expenditure of 1.2 times 10 to the 12th dollars last year. If the population of the country was 240 million last year, what was the per capita expenditure? So per capita is just, you know, uh, per capita is Latin for by the head. So per capita equals is the dollars per person. And so we do the total dollars over the total people. So in the numerator, we have the 1.2 times 10 to the 12th. And in the denominator, we have 240 million. Some of you may be able to do this in your head, but we want to convert it into the similar scientific notation um, so that we can do exponent and fraction magic. 240 million is the same thing as but well, we're going to want it as 2.4, and we just need to figure out how many decimal points that is. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 2.4 times 10 to the 8th. So remember, with these fractions, you can kind of split them up. This is the same thing as 1.2 over 2.4 times 10 to the 12th over 10 to the 8th. 1.2 over 2.4 is the same thing as 1 half. And when you divide one exponent by another, you subtract the exponent value. So this equals 10 to the fourth. Now, we don't get any halves. 1 half is the same thing as 0.5. This is an equals 0.5 times 10 to the fourth. We just have to move the decimal point then four places to the right, which equals thousand dollars.
Answer choice E. We are winners once again. I think that's going to be as good a place to stop as any. I'm not sure we can get through the next one in uh, two minutes. So uh, we will pick up next time with question 134 on page 171. You've been watching Grockett's OG TV. This is the GMAT edition where we go through the 12th edition to the guide. You've been listening to me, Jim Jacobson. That's me there. I probably should get a picture where you can see my face. So one of these days I can stop drawing it. That's sort of what I look like. Bad glasses. Anyway. Okay. So I'll see you next time. And uh, until then, good studying.